Good morning. I'm Deacon Booker, and this is the recorded Sunday School lesson for November 12th, 2023. Uh, let's open with this prayer. Almighty Father God, the one who is perfect, the one we adore, the one who made us and blessed us with so much, Father. And after you blessed us with life, you picked us up and you carried us along. And when we fell again, you gave us salvation through your sacrifice. You gave us life and happiness. You taught us how to live together and how to grow. You've given us your word, your written word. You've written your word in our heart and you came and gave the sacrifice that we could have everlasting life without pain, without death, without sin. We thank you so very much, Father. We thank you for giving us this chance to grow together, to study your word, to grow in, in love, unity for each other. So if you would just watch over us, bless us, preside over the Sunday school lesson. Father, we thank you and we worship you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Okay, good morning. Our Sunday school lesson uh, today is the greatest gift. It's coming from 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 through 13, and Romans 13, 8 through 10. Now, this whole, not just month, but quarter, we've been dealing with God's love and how his love saves us, how it freed us. And so as we start, let's go over a couple of definitions for love because as people... We, we deal with the word love every day, and it has different connotations depending on who we are and what we're dealing with. Uh, there are several uh, different meanings and types of love, but what we're going to talk about are, are the common ones for us. We have eros. It's romantic, passionate love that is often characterized by attraction and desire. This is a person-to-person -person love that's more physical. In fact, the word eros is the... Uh, root word for erotic. And we understand that that's a, it's a tangible love feeling that has a lot of physical connotation there. We have phila. Uh, it's brotherly love is how we look at it. Uh, the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, is uh, Philadelphia was an Egyptian city. It was also a city in the Middle East. And it means the love that we have for our friends, for our neighbors, if you're in a sorority or fraternity, that made a way you feel for your brother. Uh, and, and it's it's a it's a a love that we have for each other. Um, so in Eros, you don't, I mean in Phila, you don't have to know another person to feel that brotherly love for them. You can just feel it because of a closeness. Uh, uh, we have brotherly love for other black people, for other types of Christians, for people in other churches that we don't know them, but we have that love, uh, symbol by camaraderie we have. But today we deal with agape love. Agape love is selfless, unconditional love that is often associated with Christianity. Uh, they say often associated, but I only see it associated with Christianity. It's that love that we have for our fellows. Instituted by God, it's our strength. It's the type of love that we grow with. And it means so much because it's a love that gives without anything in return. So, uh, our fall quarter, God's law is love. And uh, I'd like for us to be able to look at this uh, short video here at the beginning of this lesson because love is what our, our, our woven fabric is as Christians and through salvation is built on love. And this love, agape love, well, it's the type of love that Christians have, that people have for each other, and it's our strongest expression of love. So let's look at this video. So if you've heard of Jesus, you probably know about one of his famous teachings called the Golden Rule. 
do to others what you would want them to do to you. And this, actually, is a restatement of something else that Jesus said, that the meaning of life is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's really beautiful, but what does he mean exactly by the word love? It's an unclear word in English, because you can love your mom and you can love pizza. And if the word love means the same thing in both of those cases, your mom's going to feel real bad. So what did Jesus mean in his language? Well, first of all, this love your neighbor phrase is a quotation from the Hebrew scriptures, where the word for love is ahava. However, the language Jesus spoke and taught in from day to day it was a cousin language of Hebrew, that is Aramaic, in which the word for love is rachma. But then, as Jesus' followers spread his teachings around the world, they translated them into Greek using the word agape. But here's what's fascinating. The earliest followers of Jesus who wrote the books of the New Testament in Greek, they didn't learn the meaning of agape by looking it up in ancient dictionaries. Rather, they looked to the teachings of Jesus and the story of his life to redefine their very concept of love. So one time, Jesus was asked about the most important command in the Jewish scriptures. And he first quoted from the ancient prayer in the Torah called the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. So love for God is the most important thing. But then Jesus quickly followed up by saying another command from the Torah was also the most important, to love your neighbor as yourself. So which is the most important, loving God or loving your neighbor? Jesus' answer is yes. To ask the question means you don't get his point. For Jesus, they are two sides of the same coin. Your love for God will be expressed by your love for people and vice versa, they're inseparable. And so this makes it clear that for Jesus, agape love is not primarily a feeling for someone else that happens to you, like our phrase, I fell in love. For Jesus, love is action. It's a choice that you make to seek the well-being of people other than yourself. Jesus also went on to teach that genuine love for God and others means seeking people's well-being without expecting anything in return, especially from people who are in difficult situations who can't repay you even if they wanted to. According to Jesus, this kind of generous love reflects the very heartbeat of God. And he took this even further. Jesus said that the ultimate standard of authentic love is how well you treat the person that you can't stand. Or in his words, you shall love your enemy and do good to them expecting nothing in return. For Jesus, this kind of enemy embracing love imitates the very character of God himself. Now we wouldn't be talking about Jesus still today if he had only said things like love your enemy. This is how he actually lived. Jesus was constantly helping and serving the people around him in very practical and tangible ways. And he consistently moved towards poor and hurting people who couldn't benefit him in return. He showed love for the forgotten ones, the people who usually fall through the cracks. And when Jesus eventually marched into Jerusalem, he made himself an enemy of the leaders of his people by accusing them of hypocrisy and corruption. But then instead of attacking his enemies to overthrow them, he allowed them to kill him. Jesus died for the selfishness and corruption of his enemies because he loved them. After Easter morning, Jesus and then his followers claimed that it was the power of God's love for the world that was revealed in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. As the Apostle Paul put it, God demonstrated his own agape for us in this. While we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. Or in the words of the Apostle John, God's own agape was revealed when he sent his one and only son into the world so that through him we could have life. And for John, then, this leads naturally to the conclusion, beloved ones, if that's how God has loved us, then we ought to show love for one another. So Christian faith involves trusting that at the center of the universe is a being overflowing with love for his world, which means that the purpose of human existence is to receive this love that has come to us in Jesus and then to give it back out to others, creating an ecosystem of others-focused, self-giving love. And that's the New Testament meaning of agape love. So now that we've had that short lesson, I wanted to bring that out first because as we've done this whole quarter, we're seeking to show the importance of love, God's love, that agape love. So let's look at our lesson aims to discover the supremacy of love in relation to other expressions of faith to desire to grow in love of God, self, and others. 
we're talking about an agape love and not the physical types of love. Assume responsibility for showing supreme love. So with these lesson aims, we'll move on to the lesson. So if you've heard of Jesus, you probably know about one of his famous teachings called the Golden Rule. Do to others. Oh. The key terms for this lesson will be fulfillment, the fullness, filling up, and completion. To become full, in this case, we're going to talk about being filled up with love. Fulfillment is, uh, we'll see in the lesson how we start here and we move forward to be the fulfillment. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of love for us. But how can we grow to that? Love is goodwill, benevolence, and charity. We've already spoken about how we're going to look at that. And tongues. We're familiar with tongues from certain points in the Bible, and some of us from uh, different churches or religions that we've been in, where people, people spoke in tongues. Um, we're going to touch tongues in that. We're going to speak of the tongues of angels, and you'll, you'll see why uh, such an important gift. First Corinthians was written by Paul while he was in Ephesus. He had received uh, reports from Chloe of the church of Corinth. Now, Chloe, Chloe is mentioned here and nowhere else in the Bible. We just accept that her household uh, was an important household in the church in Corinth. Uh, and her, her report was taught of dissension in the church. His letter was meant to address several problems and disorders, questions of doctrine in the church. They had factions and divisions in the church. They had sexual immorality. Uh, they had questions about married life and the liberty love granted you. They wanted to know more about spiritual gifts and why love is superior to the other physical gifts. Um, Paul was on his third journey when he received this letter. He was in Ephesus and he was wintering over. Um, Paul sent, when he got this report, not knowing Exactly. He sent a delegation of three men to Corinth, uh, Fortunus, Achiacus, and Stephanus. And they brought back a letter from Corinth uh, requesting Paul's decisions on things that are happening, uh, bad things, and on some of these questions they had. Now, I looked at uh, the ways people traveled back then and the distance from Ephesus to Corinth. And uh, I guess they traveled by sea because that distance is 180 miles by ship, but it's more than 800 by land. And land travels at the time were quite perilous. So uh, I think they traveled by sea and came back, hopefully in, in some short amount of time within that year. Okay, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and 9. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. But we know in part and we prophesy in part. When I started this, as I as I looked through to start this lesson, that first three word sentence, love never fails. I mean, it, it caught me right away. God's love is everlasting. God's God's love is unwavering. Unlike us, we we pledge our love. Sometimes um you may pledge your love to a person. You may be 20 and get married. And you pledge yourself to your spouse from the heart, meaning everything. But as you grow older, you may not feel that same love. Some people say you fall out of love. Some people say you mature and grow into a different person. This doesn't happen with God. God did not proclaim his love for us prematurely. He did not proclaim his love for us out of some arbitrary feeling one day that he had. God said he loves us and his love goes with us throughout our life. 
whatever we do, and when we pass away, God's love is still there for us. It never fails. You can always depend on God's love. That is the faith. That's what our being, not just as Christians, but as people, is built on. God's unfailing love. It's eternal. You, you, can, you can count on it. Sometimes we turn our back on God, but not him on us. And it's always there. And if you feel uh, that you've fallen out of God's love, you haven't. And if you've turned away, you can turn back. And he'll be there with open arms, accepting you as his creation. He made us and he loves us as such, which is the big difference between God's love, I said, and our greatest love, agape. His love is perfect in every way. While our love is dependent upon us so much, and we're the imperfect part. First Corinthians 13, 11 through 13. When I was a child, I talked as a child. I thought as a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am known. Um, Paul is uh, using metaphor. He describes the process of spiritual growth uh, and, and he's emphasizing the importance of, of faith and hope and charity and love. Look. We look at ourselves, each of us, uh, as we look at our, our growth as a, as a Christian, as an adult, as a maturing person. We, 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 was when we were children, we saw this. And as we grew, we got to have better understandings. We saw things different. And at each point in life, we find ourselves more mature than before. And we feel ourselves more enlightened and more more not perfect, but closer to the person we want to be. Paul is using this same metaphor as are we Christians, as we are in, on the growth. We we start out uh, as children. If you if you do bad, bad things happen to you. Then if you don't do this, you won't go to heaven. And then we learn that uh, if we act in a certain way, God will treat us in a certain way. But we continue to grow more and more. Um, doesn't stop when we get to be an adult 20. Doesn't stop in our 40s. Doesn't stop in our 60s and 70s. We continue to grow. And he's speaking of, we get to see, we get a better picture as we grow older, understanding that we never get the whole picture while we're alive. Because we'll never be perfect. This metaphor he uses for a mirror, uh, if you look in a mirror and, and, and you do get a pretty clear reflection of yourself. But at the time Paul wrote this, actually the city of Corinth was known for its famous bronze, bronze mirrors. It was highly polished and they were a little curved and they were a bit distorted at the edges. And he used that as his perfect metaphor at the time. So you could get an understanding as I look at life now, as I look at my place where God has set me, it's not the end. As I grow in Christ Jesus, I will continue to grow. And when I die finally and, and get to meet salvation, Jesus Christ, I'll understand so many of these things. I'll see them because then I will actually know. I won't be guessing. I won't have to hear what other people say because so many people have different doctrines. You will know. All of this is based on our, our love of Christ, our faith. Um, it's all hinges on our faith. Uh, we want to grow and we want to have things here at the same time.
we want to be uh, perfect now because for so many of us, we can't actually see further. We can't accept the promise of Jesus Christ that there's a better life for us and it's filled with love and it's, it's accessed by love, agape love, how we love, how we give to each other, how we serve Christ in love and trust. Uh, Romans 13, 8 through 10, love fulfills the law. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. But whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, and what other, whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, uh, Paul uses uh, the first, I mean, the later commandments after the ones about love God is how to live with each other. And it says, do not commit adultery. Do not commit murder. Uh, if you had on Wednesday at Bible study, Deacon Buford pointed out that the law given to us at that time taught us how to live and how to obey God and how to serve. But the law did not take into account love. It doesn't say, don't do this because it's wrong to do this to your neighbor. Don't murder him because you love him or respect him because you have compassion. It says, don't do this because God said, don't do it. And they followed, the Jews followed those laws. We follow those laws now simply because God said, don't do these things. Not because we have any respect for these neighbors because we care about them. We don't do it not out of love and compassion. We don't do it because we're not supposed to. The law taught us how to live with each other, how to serve God, but it didn't teach us how to love each other. And so after so many generations of doing this and the Jews felt really happy about they were able to keep these laws as well as they could. But there was no forgiveness. You broke these laws, you broke all the laws. And there was, there was no way to come back. But love does not harm your neighbor. It's Jesus, I mean, Paul says, if you do these things out of love, you don't have a problem with doing them. You don't have to decide, uh, is it wrong to do this? This man has two wives. If I take one, this man, he killed my cow. So should I kill him? You don't have to do that. You love. Love is, is, is and it's hard to teach love. <laughs> love is something that has to grow in you. You learn the first part and you grow. Love is Jesus Christ. That's God's blessing that he's given us. Love is what freed us from the law. The law was rigid. Jesus Christ is love. And love of Jesus Christ doesn't mean we don't have the law, but it means we can live within the law. Because as it was, we know nobody could follow all the laws. And if you break one law, you break them all, and your condemnation is pretty much set. So as, as Jesus Christ brought the law, the love to our hearts, I mean, people had love already. They loved each other. They loved things. They had the physical love. But Jesus Christ ensured that we have that compassionate love, the one that carries us through. Um, Paul is saying we, we don't need to know, owe anything to each other. And, and the financial part is, is just... Uh, What word am I looking for? It's not metaphor, but it says we don't need to owe things, that, but we always owe love to each other, agape love. People we don't know. When you drive down the street and you see that man on the corner 
holding up a sign that says veteran or hungry or need food to eat, when you stop and consider him and you help, whether it be a dollar or whatever, you're not, you're not obligated to do that. You do it and you don't know him. He's not your brother. He's not, from, you do it because it's the thing you should do in your heart. You can feel it. Jesus Christ gave us the ability to have that in our heart, that type of love, the greatest gift. When you turn on your TV late at night and you see uh, the commercial with the little kid in Africa laying down with his stomach bloated and flies on his face, and that touches you, touches you, that, that's, that's that compassion that makes you alive, alive in Christ. When, when you feel that for people that you don't know and the ones you do know, and you care about them for no other reason than they need it. They need your help because sometimes you need their help. And above all, we all need God's help in everything. And he's there. So that's our example. Treat other people just like you want God to treat you. Give from your heart. Bless people as God blessed us. God didn't bless us as we are because any of us are particularly smart or upstanding or we do our due diligence or are zealous. God blessed us because we're us. God loves us because he made us. And for no other reason, salvation is open to all of us. God made us. He loves us. He doesn't just love Christians. He loves everybody in the world. He loves people who worship other gods, other deities, other thoughts. He loves those who say there is no God. We're all his. He loves us all. That's his great love. And we just want to mirror it with agape if at all possible. And it is possible. It's just a matter of why. Uh, why is it difficult for people to exercise agape love? Why? We have a lot of reasons. Um, one, because agape love it's more than just an emotion. It's an action at the same time. It causes us to give, not, not just material things. It causes us to give that part of us deep down inside that true love and compassion. And we all don't want to give that. Sometimes we feel it's a weakness to love everybody. Sometimes we feel it causes us to give away things that we've earned or had. But it's, it's required of each of us, as we've accepted love and blessing from Jesus Christ, as God looked down and smiled on us, isn't it right for us to treat each other the same way? I mean, of course we love God, we all say that, but we need, this is how we show it with our agape love. Is love superior to other spiritual gifts, knowledge, tongues, prophecy? If so, why? First, because Paul says it's superior. Because if we just look up, we can see that it's superior. Um, you can be knowledgeable, have tongues, prophecy. All of these things go away. As, at some point, we're not alive anymore. God's love is still with us. The knowledge we'll have. Tongues, prophecy, these are things that are, are advantageous to us, to our congregations and the people around us. But God's love spreads. Your love should spread. And it should be something that is always right there in your heart as we help other people, as people help us, as we grow in unity as a Christian community. And we spread that agape love. It's... Uh, it's like planting seeds and it just grows, it becomes contagious if we just diligently go about it in that way. Can you think of an instant in your life where you were the recipient of kindness from a stranger 
that had no seeming benefit to the stranger. So since I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this question, I can't ask you because, well, I'm not there. But I have an example. Uh, I want to say, back in the late 70s, I was a young man. I was in the Navy. I lived in Norfolk, Virginia. And my grandmother passed away in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I... Uh, had kids in a car, we're coming back. And um, well, at that point in life, most people don't have a lot of money and I was no different. I didn't have a lot. And, and you had to um, plan. And so as we're going back, I had planned how much it would cost to do this. And I'm coming back with enough money to get gas and then refuel and make it home. When I got into Georgia, I filled up the car, and as I live, I couldn't find the money. I had the money. I don't know. I lost it. I actually lost the money somehow. It's probably, and I, and I looked in the car later on. I never found it. But it was about uh, back then to fill up the car was about eleven dollars or something along that line. And I didn't have it. And uh, I had to tell the guy, I guess you got to siphon it out. And um, that man didn't know me. And, and he, was, he was a Caucasian. And I'm thinking I'm in the South, so this ain't going to go good. And the man, he just looked at me, family in the car. And he just said, he took a piece of paper and he wrote down his name and the address of that service station and how much it was. And he said, when you get home, if you remember, just send me the money. And I always remembered that because there was no benefit to him. He could have siphoned that out. He could have made a real big problem. He could have called the law, I guess. But it was as if, and I felt, I felt not just my gratitude, but I could almost feel benevolence from him as he did that. And that was my experience with another person showing me love for no other reason than I needed it. Perfect stranger. So as we close out this lesson, uh, I'd like to just say, uh, I enjoyed teaching this lesson, facilitating this lesson. I wish I could have been in person, that we could have had more comments. But love, as we've been studying this entire quarter, is the fabric of so very much, not just as he, as not so much as Christians, but as humans also, if, if we had God's love, this agape love, if people cared more about each other than about their own personal feelings, pride, finance, so many things that we have in this chaotic world wouldn't be. As we turn on the news, read a newspaper, look on the internet, and we see so much carnage. And it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have to be like this. But uh, and we've been doing this for thousands of years now, trying to find some middle ground when Jesus Christ is right in the middle of us, arms out, saying, come to me, I'm love. If people just reach their arms out and take it, us, the people we know, if we carry... Uh, Jesus's word through our actions, through our lives, through the love we show each other, uh, it'll be a great way to carry. I look at our church and I see a congregation caught up in love and growth. 
as we spread Jesus Christ's word, not just to our families, not just to each other in church, but our community and beyond. I'm just so happy to be part. And I'm so happy that, that, that as we grow, follow each other, follow our pastor's vision given by God that we're going to be okay. Don't know how long it's going to take. But thank you so much. Uh, next week, uh, lesson 12, live as you were taught. It'll come from Colossians 2, 16 through 23.